Okay, everybody, um, you're very welcome here to um, the Heavy Industry uh, Student Presentation Venue this evening for the end of semester presentations um, of the team projects, our future office from the students of the Virtual Environments is One Life Enough module. So firstly, I want to welcome all the students um, and thank you for all showing up. Uh, so early and so well prepared, I think. Um, and I want to wish you well with your presentations this evening. We're all looking forward to seeing what you have to say. Um, and as I said earlier, we'll take each presentation one after the other, um, and then we'll have a general Q&A afterwards where you can um, explain or expand on anything that you've said, and it'll give us in the audience an opportunity to ask you questions. I'm delighted to have such a great turnout of um, supporters and guests. So all of our guest lecturers throughout the module have come back to hear what you have to say. And I welcome everybody. Thank you very much indeed. And I'm also delighted to welcome the Virtual Worlds Education Roundtable, which coincidentally meets at the same time every month um, here in Second Life um, and have requested to be here this evening to see um, some education in action, so to speak. So you guys are all really welcome. I'm delighted that you were able to make it. And also particular thanks to Andy, who has facilitated us with uh, this venue this evening. Normally, we take this presentation in our home uh, turf in TU Dublin, but it isn't quite large enough. And because it's based on the mainland, it doesn't really have the facility to take such a big crowd. So without further ado, um, let's get started. I'm going to invite the green team, um, which consists of uh, Jamal Ali, Jacob Banto, Neve Cobb, Fee Connolly and Zuza Dunn to join us up here on the stage and to make their presentation. The floor is yours, lads. Thank you. It's probably useful for this presentation if you use voice um, as well as chat, just to introduce yourselves before we go to the presentation. Okay, so hi. We are the green team, the first ones. So my name is Zuza and that's our team. We have a YouTube presentation what need for it in the chat and the link for it so i hope you enjoy and hi my name is fear Connolly, and uh yeah so hope you enjoy um, my name is jacob uh, hope you guys enjoy the presentation Okay, so you'd like us to look at that YouTube presentation now, yes? Okay. Hello, everyone, and welcome to our presentation on tomorrow's office in regards to the IT industry. Um, and I will pass it on to Jacob now. The pros and cons of technology. Like everything in life, technology has its good side and its bad sides. One good thing is it improves our efficiency. We get more done in less time. Um, we have better and faster communication with our uh, peers in work. Uh, we get the message across in just one instant. Everything's, our, it, everything's at our fingertips, from research to looking at examples to uh, search up on YouTube how to do stuff. It's all at our fingertips. As we've seen through this pandemic is that we can do this work that we do at the office. They exactly stay the same way at home. All we need is our computer. But the bad side of technology is we depend way too much on it now, especially because of this pandemic. Um, we uh, From the morning we get up, uh, our work, everything, the whole day is based around technology and also buying the equipment from work 
uh, to work at home can be really expensive. So how does technology affect us? It's shown to uh, have in, um, increased our isolation. It, it takes us away from other humans. It increases anxiety. Um, it, it can also have physical uh, things like eye strain and poor posture. But there's also good sides where it helps us keep our life in check. Everything is ordered and uh, done properly. Uh, and also efficiency in work is improved. For example, through cloud storages, uh, cloud service, storage, and keeping of no physical stuff with us, it's all on the computer. And moving forward with technology, what does it mean for us? Uh, right now, more people are working from home. It, so it shows uh, we can be a lot more environmentally friendly so that we don't need to go in um, and also cut the travel, of ex uh, travel expenses and other expenses too. We need to make sure that technology does not control us, that we don't depend on it too much, that we have the control over ourselves. But overall, it opens up a lot more opportunities to us. Office design after uh, COVID-19, how can we convince people uh, that, the, that the place uh, workplace is safe and poses no, no health uh, risk? When we talk about the future office with the COVID-19, everything that uh, points to two direction, virtual and flexible. So we have to find the solution. A beneficial way uh, office may improve their space in the future is open space. Uh, open space uh, provide more flexible flexibility and allow for the adequate uh, physical uh, distancing and safer and uh, circulation uh, traffic flow through through pathway safe uh, circulation through and around chair space can be addressed by creating a main entrance and the other one for the exit in two different direction way to prevent the traffic and the ventilation there it should there, there should be a huge window to to fresh air fresh clean air in all workplace increase ventilation rate through natural uh, irritation uh, physical distancing two meter in both the static and dynamic uh, environment uh, and reduce the density of people in the office uh, transparent barrier will need to be placed between the staff and uh, in the in the form of a screen shield and sneeze to ensure safe distancing and limit the spread of germs so with the current climate crisis, there's going to be a huge emphasis on sustainability in places of the future. Um, so sustainability is determined by the quantity of resources used and the efficiency in which they're used. Um, so this diagram shows the breakdown uh, of carbon output within the workplace. Uh, commuting is responsible for over half of carbon emissions. Uh, so this is a diagram by an ethical design and construction group called BRI showing relevant capital costs to carbon emitted within certain areas of an office building. Uh, the width of the pyramid represents savings, and as you move down the period, uh, the pyramid, the greater the savings. Uh, so at the top of the pyramid is the form and fabric, which accounts for the physical design of the office building itself. Uh, the building can be designed in a way that makes it inherently sustainable. Uh, features such as building uh, orientation and solar shading can reduce heat gain while maximizing natural light and an active twin facade allows for uh, natural ventilation while maximizing thermal value. Um, offices organized around uh, an open uh, atrium allows for natural ventilation throughout the whole building and integrating uh, vegetation into the office space itself um, will purify the air. Um, so the second uh, area that can reduce carbon emissions in a workplace is having efficient services. So making use of cloud software will reduce the size of plant rooms. Um, having electrical uh, heat pump systems, uh, changing to LED lighting, installing electrical car charging points, uh, low energy IT systems and rainwater harvesting. And the most effective way to reduce carbon emissions is uh, zero carbon technologies. So solar power, geothermal power, biomass and wind energy. Um, so to create a sustainable workplace, you need to take a holistic view. Um, so the building performance is only a small part of uh, a company's carbon footprint. And when creating new space, you need to have good design practice, 
um, practice efficient use of services to reduce waste and incorporate low and zero carbon technologies. Uh, a job where everyone can adjust the hours and place of work is probably the most appropriate work model. The CEO of Cisco Poland said that after the restrictions are lifted, we will not return to the state before the pandemic, that companies should adapt to the new work model because the introduction of a hybrid work would be one of the more permanent changes caused by the current situation. Before the pandemic, the conventional wisdom had been that offices were critical to productivity, productivity, <laughs> culture and winning the war for talent. During the pandemic, many people have been surprised by how effective are the video conferences and other forms of digital collaboration were adopted. For many, for many the results have been better than they expected. Work from home is a very good situation for many but not for all. That's why the combined office work and work from home could be the best solution for everybody. Thanks to this, we can save most of the benefits from both types. And what's the most important, with hybrid work model, we will be able to better manage the balance between private and professional life. So the four day work week, is it, just, is it practical or is it just wishful thinking? So many companies around the world have actually adopted the four day work week such as Shake Shack, Buffer, and Microsoft Japan, um, as well as the entire country of Spain, actually, a couple of years ago, did an experiment where they did a nationwide four-day work week, and results are amazing. And, but in Ireland, one group that, has, that specifically has uh, excelled with the four-day work week is the ICE group. Um, so how has the four-day work week affected ICE? So longer hours and shorter days, 39 hours over five days to 36 hours over four, um, which is more time off, but for the same pay. They're still getting paid the same for less hours. Um, and this has led to an increase in productivity and a 30% increase in sales for ICE. Um, this is due to the increased reputation for the company because they're seen as a forward thinking, progressive company. So more people will be willing to work with them and buy from them, as well as better health for the staff, both mental and physical. In fact, one employee, actually, their friend told them that only three months after the four-day work week started, they were beginning to look a lot healthier. And so, of course, there are arguments against a four-day work week. So companies need a strong financial buffer in case productivity actually goes down instead of up, because as of, obviously there is a bit of a chance that productivity will go down if people are working less days. And um, also quality issues, should there's maybe equality issues should not everyone get a four day work week. Um, so say half the company is deemed legible for a four day work week and the other half isn't. And um, the half that doesn't get it may be rightfully annoyed. And the longer hours may not suit everyone and lead to exhaustion by the end of the day. So I know no one likes working 10, 11 hours a day and with a four day work week, this would probably become the norm. Um, and also there are issues surrounding schedules such as people in projects taking different days off because most companies working doing the four day work week uh, schedule, they, people have a, a choice between taking Monday and, or Friday off. So it can lead to some problems with that. And um, that brings us to the end of our presentation and uh, thank you for listening. So that I think concludes the presentation. Um, and <clears throat> certainly, I've come to the end of it, so I hope everybody else has. Uh, yep. Uh, thank you very much indeed, Green Team. Excellent job. Well done. Um, thank you. I don't, don't think there's any clarification needed, so I'm going to invite you to retake your seats and uh, while we clap. And um, I'm going to invite the red team to take the stage. Thank you. So the red team consists of Ava Flanagan, Warwick, Monald, Walla, and I am Squidward. Okay, so we're all going to press the link and what I'm going to suggest is that you give us a countdown uh, in a moment or two so that we can all start at the same time. And while we're okay. do you want to introduce yourselves? 
Uh, so I'm Digmara, or I am Squidward, and then uh, there's also Ava, uh, Miriam, Luke, and uh, Wala is also part of our group. But uh, so if you just click on the link in uh, three, two, one. The future of the workplace and its impact on mental and physical health. In this presentation, we had a look into the future of the workplace. We considered many issues such as the design of office, studio, workshop spaces, flexible working arrangements, presence, virtual and online engagement, new social norms for the workplace, and so on. We also considered the effects that these workplaces and changes may have on mental and physical health. I'm going to be speaking about the future of office work. Due to the COVID-19 pandemic, remote work has now become the norm for most businesses. A Gartner CFO survey revealed that 74% of companies plan to permanently shift employees to remote work after the COVID-19 crisis ends. While many people prefer working from home, it's not for everyone. Remote work has caused a lot of people to experience loneliness and isolation, and many have had to cope with work from home arrangements that are far from ideal. Not everyone has a dedicated office or even a dedicated working space. A solution to this issue could be the idea of communal hubs. In the future, hubs containing workspaces and office supplies could be set up to provide remote office workers in the community with favourable working spaces. Hubs like this already exist. An example of this is Talent Garden. They currently have 21 co-working campuses in seven countries, including one in Dublin. The campuses are equipped with workstations, offices, meeting rooms, laboratories, and more. In the future, work-life balance will become much more significant. The idea of a four-day work week has been steadily gaining popularity globally. The benefits include an increase in productivity, improvement of the mental health of workers, and fighting climate change. The idea has taken on a new significance as the pandemic sharpens issues around well-being, burnout, and work-life balance. In 2019, a Japanese politician backed a bill that would give workers a four-day work week without affecting their job security. The longer weekend allowed people more time to take care of their family members, pursue educational opportunities and explore side business ventures. The result was a productivity boost of 40% and lower electricity costs. According to the Irish Times, Spain is the next country who will potentially be trialling this new work schedule which would be the first ever national level pilot of the four-day work week. I did my research on the workplace in general. Due to the COVID-19 pandemic, current labor market has lesser opportunities for full-time and part-time jobs. 14% have lost employment and 33% have been temporarily laid off. Due to less social activities and face covering in the workplace, many employees are suffering from anxiety or depression, such as cultural shifter, shift workplace. It has impacted negatively on mental as well as physical health of employees, such as increase in alcohol consumption or sleeping disorder, more stress and depression because of the lower income. Due to the COVID-19 pandemic, the future workplace trend will be more remote or work from home. It will further increase the gap of social activities, for example, many may need to change their occupation. The positive impacts of working from home will be less traffic on the road, less pollution, less driving trees, and finally, healthier lifestyle as they are working from home. I did my research on online working, more specifically on influencers, content creators, and social media. The use of social media is one of the most popular online activities with over 3.6 billion people using it worldwide in 2020. On average, we spend 144 minutes per day on social media, and since 2015, there has been an increase of over half an hour regarding to social media usage. Familiar faces we see on these platforms include Kylie Jenner, an Instagram beauty influencer, PewDiePie, a gaming YouTuber who has over 108 million subscribers, Charlie D'Amelio, a dancer and social media personality who has over 107 million followers on TikTok, as well as many more. 
But why is this a desirable career? The average wage of an influencer is between thirty to one hundred thousand dollars per year. The job is very flexible, making it a convenient side hustle or full time career that provides a steady income. One of the main aims in this day and age is to work smarter, not harder. So while this is quite a secure job, it also provides you with money that you can invest into assets. Currently, social media is having negative effects on our mental health. Cancel culture, Photoshop and false claims contribute to this issue while also misleading viewers. I'm predicting a significant growth in social media usage, especially when nicely developed digital markets catch up with other regions. The number of people using social media is expected to go up to 4.41 billion by 2025. With more people using social media, there is bound to be an increase in influencers, especially small ones known as micro-influencers. These influencers are perceived as more authentic and genuine, and even though they are small, they have hyper-targeted audiences and drive higher levels of engagement, making them perfect targets for ads and endorsements. Micro-influencers can use their power to promote their moral beliefs and values, such as sustainable living, veganism, cruelty-free products, etc. This is a big step towards a greener world, as consumers can become more aware and invest their money into helping authentic businesses create a more sustainable world. I believe that there will be an increase in sex work, especially on platforms such as OnlyFans. During the past year, there has been a 600% increase in users on the platform. Many turned to sex work when the pandemic struck and people lost their jobs. Laws and measures will have to be put in place to protect these workers. Overall, I think the effect social media has on mental health will change. People can live fulfilling lives because they can travel and participate in hobbies since they're not tied down to a nine to five. Being an influencer uh, promotes creativity and entrepreneurship. People are doing what they enjoy and feel passionate about. And as a result of an increase in representation of minorities and showing of an influencer's true self, will allow the viewers to be more confident and, ex and feel more accepted in society. My research focuses around the future workplace of the fashion industry and how this particular industry can affect our mental health. People working within this industry are 25% more likely to experience mental illness than any other industry there is. Fashion and looking good plays a crucial role in teenagers' lives. There is this constant need to avoid mockery or judgment and up your social status amongst teens at all times. An inability to be able to keep up can cause low self-esteem and major anxiety. As well as these, the pressure that comes with fashion can result in major body images, images issues such as bulimia, anorexia and so forth. In the same way that models are forced to adhere to unre unrealistic sized clothing samples, the general public are forced to feel the same way. There is also the designer element of fashion. This is known as the class-based application. People who cannot afford the latest trends or designer pieces will be left to feel unimportant or inadequate or may find themselves in a bad financial state. Expensive brands equals a sense of social status and wealth when it comes to fashion. Then we look at the fast fashion factories. Employers here are both verbally and physically abusive with their employees allowing them to work in risky and unhealthy situations that involve extremely poor ventilation, breathing in of toxic substances, injuries, and major... So, what is the future of the fashion industry, and how is its future helping with mental health issues also? Body image, inclusivity, and positivity. Brands are now introducing more plus size and diverse models in their shoots, allowing for a much larger representation of all body types and skin colours. An example of a brand that is doing so would be Savage by Fenty. Status nowadays is said to be acquired through con conscious consuming, as opposed to how expensive your shoes were or where you bought them from. Not only is this great for mental health, but it is hugely beneficial towards our climate and, cli and climate change. Consumerism. COVID-19 has allowed for a change in the future of consumerism. It has heightened the clear visibility of inequalities in the world, and 88% of US consumers want brands to help them to become more ethical and eco-friendly in their consumption of fashion. Recently, MasterCard have introduced a Doc Economy, a credit card that lets users track, understand, and reduce their CO2 footprint through carbon offsetting. Fashion brands are also using data to understand consumer preferences, monitor their shopping behaviour and create products that meet their needs, accommodating for more than one trend but also being far more efficient in the way they produce clothing and how much they actually do produce. Fast fashion releases 10% of the world's carbon emissions and nearly 20% of wastewater. 
Unfortunately, a number of sustainable fashion brands are growing and 50% of fashion retailers have reported a decrease in sales in the year of 2020. In the year of 2020 also, the second-hand market was said to be at a staggering value of 32 billion and is said to hit 64 billion by the year of 2024. Fashion is moving towards a more sustainable lifestyle. Despite 2020 in video gaming has been mostly a positive year for the industry, the to some changes like remote work and a slower supply chain. But sales compensate for that. Quantum pick up the controller more, as well as introduce a new wave of consumers to the medium. Perhaps the most substantial impact COVID 19 has had, in, had on the industry is on the companies who make the games. The pandemic has produced some mixed results for publishers and developers. In some areas, the industry is thriving, but not everything on the horizon looks positive. For video games still in development, things have been positive. Facing new restrictions amid the virus, some developers have had to delay their re release schedules, needing more time to finish their games. Highly anticipated video game releases like The Last of Us Part 2 and Ghost of Tsushima were uh, delayed because of coronavirus. One of the most impactful changes to the industry had developers around the world redirect their teams to, from large studio spaces back home to continue developing games in isolation. Pressure in the workplace has risen since the beginning of COVID-19. Pressure can be positive. It can motivate and spark us into action. However, anything that poses a threat to well-being is stressful and impacts mental health. Research by mental health charity Mind and Yugo found people that across gaming industry and other sectors are experiencing high levels of stress. Over half of those surveyed, 56%, said they found work fairly or very stressful since the pandemic began. Findings reported by the Time of for Change campaign suggest one in every six workers is affected by anxiety, depression, and 95% of employees are calling in sick with stress gave a reason because of the stigma attached to talking about mental health. One thing that is clear, in all of the COVID-19 work, workplace related literature, it's imperative to make it easy as possible for people to stay at home from, from work if they are ill or have been exposed to someone who was ill. People have been working from home for a long time. Studios have been providing employees with a re remeasurable sum of money to support them, setting up their home office as a healthy workspace, as well as people in HR teams immediately focused on mental health and physical health for, of employees. Although the impact of COVID-19 has had devastating effects on the industry, the pandemic has produced very mixed results for the publishers and developers. Total video game sales around the world reached 977 million last May, the highest the figure has ever been since 2008. With more people playing games, the makers of video games, consoles and accessories are seeing astronomical sales. Even as some lockdowns come to a close, more people have taken up gaming as a hobby. This has created large shortages of gaming consoles, accessories and games. The increased pressure developers and suppliers face is so great that pre-orders for new generation consoles have now no release date in a lot of countries. And the order of many video games and consoles are also out of stock and won't be filled anytime soon either. So the blue team consists of MCCR, Lisa Miller, Shin Yuanong, and Kevin Owens, along with Sophie Pierce and Pablo Bambino. So you're welcome, guys. Same thing. Um, please introduce yourselves and your team and tell us how you're going to make the presentation and what you want us to do. Yes, yeah, so I just pasted in a link there into the chat and you can follow that over to our presentation. Okay, so I'll kick off. So um, we, I focus on blending workspaces. So a blended workspace has become 
nearly new vocabulary for many of us over the past six months with COVID. It's quickly become a new social norm um, of our workplaces and in a survey of over 4,300 4, workers in Ireland, over 80% of them would be in favour of hybrid um, work or a blended workspace. A blended workspace allows people to control their presence in both online engagements and real life environments. With this new flexibility and working arrangements, the younger workforce you crave flexibility um, in, their, in their chosen location and also in their working hours. This is a massive change in expectations for companies um, to hold when hiring new workers uh, as the expectation is to work remote. In a survey in the US, 25 to 30% of uh, the workforce are expected to work in multiple days per week by the end of 2021. And Stephen Ralph, product manager of Saron, um, said this is an opportunity f uh, to shift a blended workforce is a golden opportunity for leaders to re-engineer how they actually get work done. So we're going to slide three here. So creatives in a blending workspace. Creative work happens when people are in a room together, bouncing ideas off each other, sparking new thinking. In a blended workspace, we'll see strategies emerging, emerging like uh, getting questions out of our head a lot of the time to people. So we can start thinking about them and then bring teams together and do good thinking in person. With a sudden surge of demand with online solutions to manage creative processes, um, many software platforms have been created to replicate this creative process. And that would otherwise be hands-on experience. Platforms like Notion give managers amazing flexibility to overlook projects and progress, and also give creative employees visual and also a user-friendly platform where they can express their ideas with their team. So we're moving on to slide four here. So, uh, today I'll be discussing workplace culture as part of our presentation. What is workplace culture? Basically, it is the overall character of a business. It is unique to that specific organization, meaning every business has its own culture. And this can include business values, the business's beliefs, their behaviors, and their goals. Businesses can create a positive culture by focusing on things like innovation, empowerment, and flexibility. So what does the future hold for workplace culture in the creative industry? Next generation of talent is not buying into the work hard, play hard culture that has existed for so long. This links back to how businesses can create a positive culture. We want to be innovative, we want to feel empowered, and we want flexibility. And I think that is something that is coming to light in recent years, particularly during COVID. Today, a company's culture is defined not by what they say it stands for, but by the day to day experiences of its staff. Two steps that could help reimagine workplace culture post lockdown. Number one, reconstruct how work is done. Organizations should take this time to reflect on their values and culture and the interactions and practices of such culture. Number two, decide people to work or work to people. In recent years, competition for talent is fiercer than ever. At the same time, some young creatives are less willing to relocate to the employer's location than they have been in the past. Roles could be reclassified into employee segments, such as fully remote or hybrid remote. Again, this links back to wanting more flexibility. Both require upskilling, but talent sourcing may become easier due to fewer geographical restraints. And up next is Shin. Um, I'm Shin Yen, and for my part is about the physical workspace. Physical workspace is a place where people come together to work in person, whether on collaboration projects or individual ones. Next is about the consideration for the workspace, lining air quality, temperature, and effect on our physical and mental health. For example, working under the side of darker, people will exhaust, and noisy sounds will make us unable to concentrate on work. So they play an important role in our physical and mental well-being. And the bottom is about the consider when you create your ideal workspace. And let's move to the next page. It's about the physical workspace in the creative field of the future. Before the workspace is the creative field that working position cannot be changed. Second is lack of personal working space. And the last is employee can't freely choose working environment. 
Next is the after part. Due to the impact of the pandemic, people work from home is much more freedom so that they get more inspiration. Besides that, many people modify their home space become their own studios. And the last is the employee can get in this relaxing environment and get more rest time after they get off their work. And next is my last slide. I, I divided into two parts. First is about the hard to define in workspace. When the designer, they create a workspace, have to face some part is hard to define. We cannot give the customized workspace for every employee. Second is natural contact. It's not every, every company close to these green areas. And the last is plenty of natural light is consists of the building. Next part is, the, is about the advantages of the modern workspace object. Flexible layout such as movable table and dividers and biophilic design or design that incorporate aspect of natural life, plant life, would in order to contribute to human health. And the chart it shows that accommodating workspace matter to every generation. And next is Sophie. The world witnessed a historic shift in, 20, in the 2020 job market due to COVID-19 pandemic. Some companies used to offer the ability to work from home as a perk, now it has become the norm for most businesses. In 2025, an estimated 70% of the workforce will be working remotely at least five days a month. While 2020 may be considered the year of remote work, it is just the beginning as we see the trend continuing in 2021. Remote work has changed performance management considerably. Organizations will increasingly focus on the work done instead of hours worked, making tools and apps to work manage to help manage remote employee performance more essential. To, to maximize employee efficiency, employers will need the visibility over the workers of over what the workers are doing. At some point it may even be necessary to create a new job position, like director of remote work to oversee production and collaboration to ensure operational efficiencies. Some companies are also making performance reviews ongoing rather than uh, rather than annual. Continuous feedback will become essential as managers strive to help employees navigate their job responsibilities and meet performance expectations. Rethinking how goals are set and identifying key performance metrics will be critical to managing remote workers in the new normal. So we jump down to slide 13 here. Traditionally, people left school or college with the hope and intention of remaining in their job for as long as possible. But the days of marrying into your job are long gone and the average worker today only stays their job for 4.4 years. So this new job hopping trend sees millennials having 15 to 20 jobs over their working lifetime, which is just a huge shift from previous generations. Next slide. One of the reasons for this trend is that Gen Y are more motivated by job fulfillment than previous generations. So, and job hopping has been found to contribute to job fulfillment. So what this means for the future workplace is that companies will have to adapt in order to retain their talented staff um, by placing a greater emphasis on job fulfillment in terms of their motivation and engagement of staff. And this can be achieved by providing more opportunities to continuously learn and make meaningful contributions through creative work. Um, expand creative skills and gain um, more creative experience. Research shows that job hopping additionally provides better financial stability as creatives can hop jobs to climb the ladder where positions become available um, in different companies. Recruiters traditionally looked at job hopping in a negative light because it was seen as not being able to hold down a job. But this is changing and job hopping on CVs is increasingly being seen as a positive. So more and more recruiters are looking for uh, a wealth of experience on your CV. The creative sector in particular places huge emphasis on diversity of skills. And many creative skills are easily transferable, which means job hopping is and now a vital tool in building your CV, like a creative portfolio of your skills and experience. Job hopping may also result in um, creative industries creating shorter contracts and adopting their training methods to facilitate a quicker transition of staff. And the last slide, some research suggests that job hopping can pose challenges uh, in terms of financial security and job security and in order to ensure artists and creative workers are protected in this sense policies are regularly made um, in order to ensure fair living and working conditions of artists and creative workers and fair re remuneration such as the paying the artist policy
So I've been focusing on workplace sustainability and its importance in the future of the creative industries. So I just want to start with this quote from the UN, which says that the creative economy is not only one of the most rapidly growing sectors of the world economy, it is also a highly transformative one in terms of income generation, job creation and export earnings. So this shows how important the creative industries are for the future. So it is important that these growing industries are sustainable in the amount of energy that they produce. So due to the COVID-19 pandemic, most people have started working from home. This is sure to have an impact on future workspaces. This first graph on the bottom left shows a breakdown of the types of energy used in residential buildings, while the graph on the top right shows overall residential energy consumption. As we can see from these graphs, energy sources such as oil and gas are still heavily favoured over renewable energies. With the current increase in people working from home, the use of renewable energies needs to be increased to allow for a more sustainable workspace. We can also see the jump in residential energy use in the last year. With an average increase of 15 to 20 percent per household, this proves the importance of lowering our energy output when working from home. While working from home seems to be a part of the future, the office and the physical workspace is still as important as ever. This means it is just as important to lower our energy consumption in the office as it is at home. Similar to before, renewable energies make a small minority of energy used in the office buildings, showing again that the current over-reliance on non-renewable fossil fuels. While not everything can be fixed quickly, there are small ways to make a big difference in our workspace. Things like regularly powering off one office computer or even putting it in rest mode can save £300 of CO2 a year, or an average company going paperless will save 48 trees a year. While there are small scale and large scale solutions, all of us must individually take steps to reduce our energy consumption working from home or working from an office. So that's our presentation, thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Blue Team. You may leave the stage to wild applause. While the yellow team approach. And the yellow team consists of Stormzada, Aggie, Yinky, Azabel, and Sarah Voiles. The stage is yours, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, hi, everyone. We're at Team Yellow, and this is our presentation about tomorrow's office. Uh, here's the YouTube link for the video. You can start watching as soon as you open it. Uh, apologies in advance, but there are no CC captions in the video, as all, as all the information is provided on the slides. Feel free to ask any questions after the presentation, and thanks for watching. Hello, we are Team Yellow, and this is our presentation on tomorrow's office. Our work environment is constantly changing due to factors such as technology, sustainability, and environmental issues. Today, we are gonna talk about um, some of the factors which will affect the future workplace. And these are VR technology, workplace flexibility, machines and artificial intelligence, workplace during pandemic and sustainable workplace. So what is virtual reality? Virtual reality or VR in short refers to an artificial three-dimensional space which you can interact with using technology like a VR headset and controllers etc. It has many uses and applications for example big screen which allows you to view other people's screens in a virtual environment. It allows you to collaborate on projects and work together just like in an office, except from your own home. On the other hand, games like VRChat allow you to meet up with your friends and play mini games and do other fun activities using VR. It has custom avatars and places, just like Second Life. VR technology is rapidly evolving. Just a few years ago, there wasn't even any consumer VR headset on the market. Nowadays, there are many different offerings from many different companies. VR technology is becoming more accessible every year because it's getting better and cheaper really quickly. The industry is growing at a near exponential rate. The VR sector is estimated to grow a compound 20% every year, 
with a market size of $90 million by 2027. Companies which produce VR headsets are doubling down on research and development while also increasing their production. The headsets are becoming lighter and smaller, with better resolution and refresh rates. Standalone headsets are also becoming really powerful, eliminating the need for cables and a connection to the PC. While VR is great, it is not quite ready to replace offices just yet. Typing on a keyboard proves very challenging when you cannot see your hands or keyboard. There are still hurdles which need to be overcome. However, these problems are going to get solved as time goes on. I'm going to talk about the workplace flexibility. Workplace flexibility is when an employer gives some of full freedom to its employees to choose the time, locations, and the manner in which they are work to help align organization go with the individual goals. A flexible workplace is good for both the employer and the employee. It not only helps increase productivity in the organizations but also increase the certifications of the employees. In an article by James Master, the future of work job hopping is the new normal for millennials. Over workplace flexibility is one of the tips for companies to keep their employees around more than a year. Also, according to the research by Future Workplace, flexible hours and generous daily work policies are even more important to younger workers than salary. So, workplace flexibility is getting more important in the future workplace. So, let's see how VR Workplace achieve workplace flexibility. Virtual reality can enable the HR department in multiple ways. First, virtual reality applications can enable employees to get as much mobility and flexibility as they desire by virtually accessing the office space. Thereby, virtual reality technology gives employees the autonomy in terms of when, where, and how they work. Second, what about using virtual reality to help potential candidates take more informed decisions. In a context, virtual reality technology can be used for showing a day in the life of an employee at the employer's organization and experiencing a tour of the company office. Facilitating this can in the end benefit the human resources department that both can increase retention rates and decrease employee turnover. I'm going to talk about uh, machines and AI. So, machines have made jobs obsolete for centuries. The spinning jenny replaced the weavers, but uh, buttons displaced elevator operators and internet drove travel agencies out of business. As one example, a coronavirus improved the amount of automation and use of machines. The two, bo two booths uh, were closing to protect the health of drivers and of two collectors. Uh, going forward, drivers would pay breed bridge tools automatically via fast track tags uh, mounted on their white shoes or would receive bills sent to the address linked to their license plate the deployment of robots as a response to the coronavirus was rapid they were sudden uh, suddenly cleaning floors at airports and taking people temperatures in theory automation and artificial intelligence should free humans from dangerous or boring tasks so they can take on more intellectually stimulating assignments making companies more productive and raising work, uh, worker wages so the number of robots raised within years as you could see in this example of the automotive industry so artificial intelligence is becoming more adept at jobs that once were uh, the purview of humans, make it harder for humans to stay ahead of machines. Uh, the U.S. government incentivizes uh, companies to automate uh, by giving tax break from breaks from buying machinery and software, as example. So these advances make AI an easy choice for companies. Changes to workplace during COVID-19 pandemic. The pandemic changed our lives, uh, including the way we work. Uh, many people have to work from home or uh, remote work remotely. Um, McKinsey, which is a global management consulting firm, carried out a research which found many people enjoy working from home. They find that they are productive or more productive. Um, no commutes is a huge factor in this. People don't have to be driving to Dublin for hours, being stuck in traffic every morning. Uh, they, instead, they can use this time to have a, you know, time with their families or maybe just be more productive with the work. 
Um, the companies will also benefit from changing uh, to work in remotely. Um, companies can access talent easier because people won't have to relocate, uh, move a city or a country if they can work remotely from home. Uh, this new way of working is going to evolve and uh, we're going to need to access new technologies and new tools uh, to help enhance the, the, the work routines and the productivity. Uh, so, for example, always on video conferencing or um, remote uh, collaboration spaces such as virtual whiteboards. Um, another way companies are going to benefit from the situation is they won't have to rent or buy big office spaces and maintain these. Uh, Deloitte, uh, international blight of a uh, brand of professionals, um, advise leaders of organizations to redefine what productivity looks like in the new environment, which I think is a valid point. Like I said, we ju don't just sit at the office desk from nine to five, have several tasks to do. And if we get them done by five, that means we had a productive day. We work from home, but we constantly connect it uh, and the work uh, completely um, is evolving and changing. So we need to redefine what that productivity is. They also made a valid point of setting a good work life balance. Working remotely means always being connected. And it's so important now to switch the phone off when we finish at five o'clock, log out emails, do not check the emails at dinner time or uh, before bedtime and instead set a good boundaries and stick to the timetable just for our own health and, and the work-life balance. This section will look at VR and its relation to sustainability. So why strive for a sustainable workplace? Well, climate change is an issue that needs to be tackled immediately as time is running out. In order to do that, the whole of humanity needs to make changes to their lifestyle now. David Attenborough has warned us that if we do not take action, the collapse of our civilizations and extinction of much of the natural world is on the horizon. In an article called The World Science is Warning to Humanity, they state that we're heading towards potential damage onto planet Earth, such as fresh water availability, ozone depletion, marine life depletion, forest loss, biodiversity destruction and climate change. This means that we all need to take action now. And in order to do that, we need to make many changes to our lives, which involves the workplace. We need to strive to make our workplaces a lot more environmentally friendly. So why choose VR for a sustainable future workplace? Well, to begin with, inside a virtual reality office, there will be nowhere near as much rubbish, electricity usage, paper waste, water usage, gas usage. And outside the office, there will be a major cut down in vehicle emissions as there will be less cars travelling to and from work on a daily basis, resulting in a major cut in carbon pollution. And not to forget, who doesn't like working from the comfort of their own home from time to time, knowing that you are doing your part in combating climate change? So, in conclusion, to summarise, we think that VR will play a huge part in the future workplace. VR technology is rapidly evolving, becoming better and more affordable year by year is also seeing widespread adoption. The workplace of the future will be a mix of machines and human, where, ta where easy tasks will be done by robots, and the most sophisticated ones will be done by human beings, with a big assistance from technology. Businesses are moving towards being more sustainable in the workplace and in the future. We will see drastic changes. Virtual reality is a sustainable option for businesses to use to help tackle climate change. Thank you for listening to our presentation. If you have any questions, please feel free to ask them now. Well done, Yellow Team. Fantastic. So if you'd like to take your seats, we'll have a short Q&A and, and a wrap up. Firstly, let me thank and congratulate all the students. Well done, everybody. That's um, a fantastic job. Um, and for a first effort, uh, I have to say I'm, I'm really impressed. Really interesting, well-researched, well-presented, um, and very well done by everybody. Just for our guests uh, to share a little bit of information that you might be interested in, this is um, an optional elective module, so it's, it's a short one. It just runs for one semester. This is our 12th week together. The students come into it um, totally inexperienced in Second Life. Um, they're all undergraduates on a range of programmes all in the creative area. So we have students from first year through second year and third year. 
and studying subjects like architecture, design, fine art, visual culture, and the creative and cultural industries. So a range of students uh, from different disciplines and from different years in their BA. Um, the purpose of this presentation and the purpose of the module really is to introduce them to working collaboratively in virtual environments. We've been running the module now for about 12 years. So up until last year, it was all very theoretical. And then all of a sudden last year, um, it became very real and very practical. Um, but bear in mind that uh, the content, while important, is not really the key issue um, at heart here. And what the students are going to be assessed on um, once I finish up here is their ability to work together as a team and also their understanding of teamwork. So how they've managed to get on together and build their team during the last 10 or 12 weeks, what they've noticed about how teams function together and sometimes don't function together, um, and how they've tried to overcome the shortcomings of the virtual environment over the real environment, and just the general issues that crop up when people are working on teams. It's been a pleasure to have you here this evening, and we look forward to further engagements along this line.